Look, here's the thing. If you make it engaging enough and you make it feel good enough, the things that don't make sense don't matter. There's all kinds of shit in the original trilogy that probably doesn't make sense or is inconsistent internally or otherwise. And you know what? It doesn't matter because it was so good. Beep boop, Star Wars music. You can't use Star Wars music, first of all. Why not? Unless that's your, your trick. It's like, oops, we used copyrighted music and our episode got removed. <laughs> Sorry, guys. Welcome to the Cypher Sci-Fi. We explore how and why. Cobra, what movie do we watch? The Last Jedi. No. We watched the last uh, <laughs> the last Starwalker or Skywalker. <laughs> One of those. Who cares? Chris doesn't. <laughs> hey, who cares? They didn't care. Why do I care? <laughs> okay, we watched the last Star Wars movie, The Rise of Skywalker. Uh, they might have given away a bit of the review there. Dude, so, spoiler alert, we're going to spoil the movie. We're going to spoil past Star Wars movies, I guess, maybe uh, by accident. And, man, I the the real spoiler, though, is even in any other Star Wars movie we've done, it's been, uh, there's been, like, a hard thing to talk about. There's been a science thing to talk about. In the last one, The Last Jedi in particular, there was the salt planet geology, and there was, like, the Holdo maneuver hyperspace kamikaze situation like explosions in space there was there's all kinds of stuff and i feel like this one didn't give us a lot of stuff so we might actually just be talking about the movie for once we apologize in advance i have feelings about this movie colbert as someone who would have said i don't care about star wars that much feeling kind of mad it seems that some people on the internet liked this movie the people that did enjoy this thing i don't want to shit on their parade and we try always. We 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 even avoid reviewing in general all the time, and especially when it's a negative review, because it's not the constructive thing. We don't need to be putting that energy out. There's plenty of other people putting out that energy. But this movie was confounding, and I'm feeling upset on the behalf of Star Wars. I'm not sure it made a lot of sense. A lot of it. It's all just so. It just feels so disappointing having had all of this stuff. This is a trilogy of trilogies. It's this humongous overarching project. And that's why I feel... Over decades. You can never satisfy all the people, regardless of how well it was made. And I'm not I'm not hating on any... Like, I was not primed to be upset here. And again, I do not care. But as much as I do not care, I'm very upset now. <laughs> it's protesting very loudly for someone who doesn't care. <laughs> because The Force Awakens, I liked a lot. It was like Star Wars, but again, and I liked it. It was good. Well, that's, a, that's the thing is... That was all fan service rehash. This, again, this was a lot of fan service in this movie. The issue being, it just kind of ignored the previous movie. It yeah. was like, this doesn't count anymore, and we're going to ignore that, and then we're going to change this story a bit. Well, the fan service is like, hey, Chewie gets his medal. Yeah. And the ignore bit being like, hey, your parents are, there were no one. But your grandparents <laughs> are, though. They were really someone. <laughs> we're lying. Where the first one was like redoing Star Wars Episode Four, which is great. This one was like a collection of references to past things you might care about, but nothing to make you care about the thing that was actually happening. Uh, and that was, you're right, like a, a major thing here was it felt like such a big, was it just like a big F you to the last movie? In part, yes. I know, like JJ- And that was the thing, is <clears throat> he went and he did a lot of different things. He did. And I know quite a few people are upset about that. Okay, and then we have people like Miles Greb, who's been on the show a number of times, who is one of those people who is very, very, very invested in the Star Wars mythology. And what Ryan Johnson did in the last film, The Last Jedi, was so at odds with what he felt was a good thing to do with all that mythology that he was like, I swear off Star Wars and I'm done. But if I don't, like, back to me not being invested, I'm not invested like that. They can do whatever they want as long as it's good. That you care less about the arc of Luke Skywalker and more like, hey, look at that red planet. That's pretty sweet. Yeah, yeah. It was a little salt and stuff. That last movie did a bunch of cool things. And they were all either ignored or completely undone in this new one. It was a really strange thing to do. I, I don't even, either way would have been fine. I just wish that these three movies had been a coherent collection of three movies. Imagine, imagine if there was like a, a storyline or an arc and they followed it and then it was like over. But there, yeah, but there was... <laughs> And that was George Lucas. The people are fairly upset with his second trilogy. Oh, so wait. So we have the original Star Wars, which <gasps> is great. Everyone loves Star Wars. We have the prequel trilogy is what you're talking about. Yep. So instead of the whole story as written out by George Lucas, we get Disney buying it out. And 
making their own, going their own path. <clears throat> Admittedly, from what I've read, George Lucas's probably wouldn't have been received too well, especially coming from the pe- prequels. If he got what he wanted for the sequel trilogy, because it would have been a lot more of the midi chlorian like ecosystem of the Force type deal. And as much as I like, no one likes the prequel trilogies, right? No, people do. People, okay, they're just younger than you. Children. Okay. Oh, maybe that's it. They're not children anymore. They're, they were children when it happened. Okay, that makes sense. And you know what? In light of how this came out, like I'm looking at the prequel trilogy in a new light because as much as maybe I didn't love what they did, and the first one didn't need to exist at all, like at all, there was a story there that was told, which is something that, that shouldn't be high praise, but like. It was a coherent story of how did this kid turn into this monster and eventually be redeemed in episode six. That's a story I want to hear. And if you chop it up a little bit, like maybe it was a long way of going about it. If you chop that up a little bit into like take two and three as one movie, cut some of the fat, it is an interesting story of Anakin turning to the dark side. Sure. It's uh, a rise and fall followed by a hero's journey. And then we get another hero's journey right after that. What was George Lucas going to do? It's weird to think about because George Lucas and Lucasfilm, they became huge. But this was Star Wars started out and I mean, remain until Disney purchased it. That's an independent thing. It was not. They had deals with the studios, but it was not owned by Disney. And that's why George Lucas is able to be like F you. And he made a director with a vision, had a story, and he made the sequel trilogy. However, it may have been good or bad, like someone had a vision and did a thing and it was coherent. You would think that, I guess, I guess you're gambling when Disney purchases Star Wars and what are they going to do with this thing without the guy who made the whole deal anymore? And you wind up with a hodgepodge, not a hodgepodge, there's two different directors, but you wind up switching directors halfway and then switching back again in a way that kind of undermines the entire thing. It's weird. Especially when you have such an extended mythos. and Not anymore. Yeah, universe around it all. Because you have to remember, it's not just the movies. There's a lot of other material out there. And then having the story change for these three movies, switching hands. Maybe it's the passing off that got it weird. I don't know. This project, what makes this different from like Marvel, where Disney purchased the thing? It wasn't a like five-tiered plan written out in advance for the next three decades. Is it that they didn't have it from the start-ish? Because they didn't have it from the start, but the start-ish? With whatever vision. Although George Lucas had a vision, and he had a script, and I'm sure he had a treatment for it. But it wasn't Disney's vision, and clearly. <laughs> it wasn't their vision, yeah. Whether or not it's because of how the first, the prequels did, or how they imagined it would do. Because look back at our, our Marvel, uh, what's it called, Avengers Endgame episode, where we expressed a lot of appreciation for how well that all went. Some of the movies weren't amazing, but overall, the entire thing, it was 23 movies, but they're able to t- tie all that together in a, in a universally like satisfying way, right? Everybody liked it. We were into it. Nothing but praise is all I hear about how well it all came together over a couple dozen movies, literally, almost, maybe. They did that, and I'm like, why can't you handle just a trilogy of Star Wars movies? But is it is it just an incompatibility of a vision from the beginning? Because they did have the claws in this to Marvel real deep, real early. It could also be that if you're not specifically following George Lucas, then what is the Force and the Jedi? I think that's kind of not very well defined. Especially it's, if you're going to ignore the midi chlorians. Yeah, and you should. So it's a Space Wizard movie for kids. How how much that do you want to explain this? That seems pretty what you can do. <laughs> Look, here's the thing. If you make it engaging enough, and you make it feel good enough, the things that don't make sense don't matter. There's all kinds of shit in the original trilogy that probably doesn't make sense or is inconsistent internally or otherwise. And you know what? It doesn't matter because it was so good. We're willing to ignore or we're willing to spend multiple episodes of podcasts or hours and hours and hours of people on YouTube and books and books and books of people bending over backwards to make those things work because those movies deserve it. If you deserve it, people will go to great lengths. And this, we do this all the time on the show, even though we like avoid review every time except for this time. We go to great lengths to bend over backwards to make something work because the thing deserves it. And I, I think the fact that we like – the re- our no- my notes are just like a long list of all these things that I d- don't make sense. I think especially in this movie, not in the overall thing necessarily, 
but like especially in this one it seems like whoever made this didn't have a lot of respect for this universe such that they didn't care if it made sense either although it was abrams which is a seven which you enjoyed very much i know that and maybe is this similar is there an analog here with what he did with star trek and maybe they're, they're kind of good action movies or whatever but you notice the star trek doesn't have an end so he's more open to do the thing where he makes the exciting first movie multiple times. And I would say Star Trek is not a great movie, typically. The Star Trek format usually doesn't make the greatest movies, at least in the movies that have been made. Yeah, I mean, there's good episodes of Star People Trek. People are like, oh, there's <laughs> a good one. I like the seven of them. <laughs> it's in every other formula, I think, is how it works for Star Trek, right? But there's no, there's no finality. Maybe helps. So J.J. could do his thing where he has an exciting setup. Like he starts lost and leaves. There's no pressure to close the deal in Star Trek. So we can't be that dissatisfied with him yet. Star Wars, they set it up for some reason. They set it up like there's going to be an ending. Well, yeah, they kind of need to. And I, I'm glad. I want things to end. I always talk about this like when there's a TV show or whatever. Like I'm not going to invest in something that's going to go on and on and just peter out. <clears throat> I want there to be a story with the beginning, a middle, and an end. I wish I got one of those for Star Wars. Which may have been part of the complaint. What? See lack of Skywalkers in the last three. Yeah, and and second one even kind of took pains to be like you don't need to be a special Skywalker person to be special. You know, anyone anyone could be a hero type of thing is is what a lot of people took from that one. And the new movie's like, nope, <laughs> Emperor's back. <laughs> that was confounding, dude. Why? Why? Just it gives you a nice thing to tie it up with. Uh, is. Literally, this guy is the Sith that has been ruining everything behind the scenes. This was not alluded to. This was not a buried lead. This was not a long-term plan that it's like, oh, how clever. And they spent like the the merest like three sentences being like, yo, the Emperor's back. Why? I don't know. He's been there the whole time. Anyway, get in your ships. Like the movie opens, the, the crawl, I kind of liked it. It was a bit, I, I don't feel like you should be introducing that the Emperor was there the whole time. In the crawl of the third movie of the trilogy, that is the end of Star Wars. But I like that it was super, it, the dead speak in all caps with an exclamation point was like, oh, we're getting back to pulp. You know, the, the pulp serial sort of feel of Star Wars. I like where this is going. Maybe it's going to be good. But that's not set up. That's like, this should have been there already. It's almost like they were making it up as it went along. And there's that awkwardness. And I wonder how much of the movie being kind of off is that for whatever degree they were planning, things i don't trust that they had a lot of plans but for to whatever degree they were planning carrie fisher died like what do you do in a thing like this when you're when one of your most major characters i I think that was a big impact on this movie it was a really awkward thing quite a major role in it and now you're reduced to you know what footage did you have and how can you fit that in and how many shots can you have just over her shoulder of other people emoting like, technically, the things that people said to her and in response to her were things you could say in English that made sense to those things. But it was all real awkward. Never underestimated a droid. Yeah, okay, thanks, Leia. I was <laughs> <laughs> about underestimating this droid. Never underestimated the droid. <laughs> they really had to fudge that together. They did, they did a not horrible job considering the thing they had on their plate, maybe. Maybe they shouldn't have done the thing they had. Like, it felt really weird. Like, I wasn't sure if they did, like, maybe there was some CG stuff that was better than the young Leia and some compositing with faces. And maybe they got some, like, you know, on Conan O'Brien, they used to have, like, the mouth moving over the faces. <laughs> Probably can't do that. <laughs> that would be great. But they didn't do that. It turns out it is all just uh, old footage from the last couple movies that didn't make it to the films. I mean, you could have just had her be a little blue hologram. And then you get a lot, of, a lot of leeway, right? She could just be—it's her communicating uh, from afar with a Carrie Fisher sounded like. I think that would have been—I don't know if it would be disrespectful, but I think that would have been how it was viewed, and they didn't do that, and it was probably the right thing. I don't know what the good answer would be. Like, what is the right course of action? Maybe any course of action at all would feel weird and wrong, but this one felt weird and wrong. And then, what's the plot of this one? What's the story? It's like we have to. We're finding the thing to find the thing to find the thing to get the Emperor and kill him. It's, it's mostly the It's mo- a bit of a fetch quest, yeah. Yeah. It's got that kind of formula to it. But it's the matter, Emperor, dude. for some reason, decides to send out a message being like, I'll get you all, <laughs> instead of just releasing this fleet. Yeah, why warn anybody? It's all- In Fortnite you know, or something. I've Is got that what this, it was? I've got this evil plan. 
Do you have any idea? It was a Fortnite thing? It was a special event, yeah. And it did what? He Is that when he... It was a message. We saw the message out. there? Yeah. But that makes it the mission now is we got to find the Emperor. And he's on a hidden world. Oh, where is he? Exegol. I don't know if anyone else uh, heard Mario's voice every time they said that. <laughs> dun, 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 dun. <laughs> it happened to me once. And I, was, I did it like Mario. And then I had to make it happen to Chris. It's a hidden world, Exegol, that no one could find. And how is it hidden? It's like next to a nebula or something, right? Well, it seems strange because it seemed somewhat distant from the planet. Like you could just go around it. Yeah, it wasn't inside the nebula. It was like nebula adjacent, which can confound scans or whatever. But why does that make it so you have to go? Why is it hard to get to in that case? Like you can, space is big. And Star Wars has magic and magic technology, so who knows? But it's very, it could be very hard. Like imagine what we know now, the ways we find planets around stars is it's already very difficult, but that's also planets around stars. Like, what if they're hiding on a rogue planet or something, lost in the depths of space and dark? That could actually be very hard to find. The problem is, what if you're building the largest fleet ever assembled on that planet? You'd think there'd be some commerce in and out that might reveal the location. And not just the largest, but also (laughs) some of the more technologically advanced ones. Yeah, Yeah, it's larger than ever, and it's a bunch of mini Death Stars. Like... Think of the resources that were marshaled to build one Death Star, and then subsequently the larger Death Star. But those are Death Stars. This wasn't the largest fleet known in existence. So I'm thinking, this is a larger project than either of those, right? These are Star Destroyers. That's a lot of people. It took a large, large spend from the Galactic Empire, which took its resources from many, many worlds... To construct those things in public view because they're making a goddamn Death Star. How do you hide it? Constructing a fleet of mini Death Stars seems like it should involve resource marshalling that exceeds the capacity of a world, which is where it was, which must mean there are supply lines. Like if we talk about, we had the jokey conversation like clerks about the contractors on the Death Star. You need the contractors on the largest fleet ever. To build it, too. It should be revealing the planet. I don't understand how you have a secret of this. The necessary industrial base to build that, I mean, you just have a competing, like, everything at that point. You have your own empire. Yeah. Yeah. It took, again, it took the resources of the Galactic Empire marshaled towards this project to make the Death Star. This is possibly a larger project. Where's it come from? The supply lines and the labor and how many people need to work on a ship and... That's like, it's not the important thing. And we had fun joking around that for the original trilogy in our old, old, old episodes about those. And like, lol, how many contractors got killed when they blew up the first Death Star when it wasn't done, right? But it was joking, and it still made sense. Like, it was a galactic empire with resources and supply lines. But these were regular ships, Chris. They just managed to get the planet-destroying lasers massively smaller. And I guess the reactors? Much, much smaller? I wonder if we talked – I think we did this a little bit on some other Star Wars episodes where we noticed that, like, technology doesn't seem to get better generally. You know what I mean? very quickly. Like, maybe magic has that sort of effect on the world where, like, we're not going to really invest in new technology and miniaturization. And, like, the compounding effect of technological progress that we expect in real life now here, my computer in my pocket is unimaginably more powerful than the one 30 years ago. But having noticed that in Star Wars, like, it's kind of static. It's, uh, the Death Star wasn't, like, a leap. It was just a huge project. You know what I mean? And now we get this other thing where, like, it turns out Death Stars fit on a tiny gun. That's miniaturization. That's a leap. This final is iterative, Chris. That's iterative. This is the first time we've seen that in Star Wars, and I should be happy about it. Technology they, beating magic. They learned from their, uh, super lasers, or whatever they call them. From the first Death Star to the second one, to... Oh, don't forget we had the planet that sucked up a sun and shot it out again. Oh, Star Killer Base. Right. <laughs> I guess we did we did wonder too in the last one. We're talking about the last Jedi. You're going from that was the last Jedi? Was that the last Jedi? Or was that the one before that? It was a new hope, then the last Jedi, right? You mean a new hope too. <laughs> <laughs> a new hope redux. <laughs> this time it's personal. <laughs> Electric book loop. <laughs> <laughs> so we go from Death Star to bigger Death Star. To a planet-sized Death Star that is literally planet, but they use it as, like, the Death Star conveyance. 
And we're wondering, what's next? What could you possibly do? I wonder if we have ideas, and I should have looked at the episode to see. what. Where else can you go from there? How do you make a better Death Star than a planet? Is the next one going to be a sun? A star, Or is the next one going to be a star, I should say? I don't know how that would work. Apparently, the answer is you make like a million of them, but they're small. The Death Star fleet. It's fitting for the name. Final order. It's presumptive, but a cool name. You're going to be wiping out planets that uh, all the people who are rebelling live on. That seems like a lot. To blow up all the planets? Seems like a little bit overkill to me. Like a slash and burn sort of war policy still leaves the place there. It's just like the houses are gone. You know? You can rebuild. The resources exist still in the sure. place. They still exist. They're just in small chunks. <laughs> yeah, dude. You're really, you're really uh, going for broke on that. Are we... I don't know. There's probably numbers in lore and in canon. But how many planets do we have that have stuff and are useful? You know? Is there enough that you can totally blow up half of them and you'll still be good it's for be, stuff? Right? It's the entire galaxy. There's a lot of planets in the galaxy. Habitable ones, maybe. Depends. And so, whatever the reason, it is very hard to find this fleet. This planet and this fleet, largest fleet ever constructed, hard to spot, somehow. So we have to do like a Indiana Jones, you gotta get the thing to get the thing to get to the place. The knife was- It seems a, really weird that what? it would be on a knife with a pullout thing. And that you have to go against the, like, silhouette of the Death Star. That is a very bad way to encode spatial information. Where the input, where the input to that system is so variable. The input being, like, where are you? You know? the And in Indiana Jones type context, when there's an old artifact, there's an ancient thing that points to the thing, if the light goes through it just right and does this and that and that. Like, things degrade over time, over millennia. Since we have, you know, here's an ancient Mayan so-and-so. And if you put it just right... It turns out the earth moves, the rocks deteriorated, the jungle grew, and this thing doesn't work, is what should happen, right? But this has only been like 30 years. When did someone make this knife? Why not just take the thing out and put it somewhere safe? Yeah, and why a <laughs> knife that says it's in the, like, Emperor's throne room on the Death Star? You could just say, like, it's in the Emperor's throne room on the Death Star. I mean, I could see that being an actual key, like a physical key. Which is a weird way to secure things in Star Wars Techno Magic Land, but sure. C-3PO can read the thing. But he wasn't able to translate it, which was, I thought, kind of funny. He mentions it's actually like a legal thing because of this Galactic Senate. So this is calling back to the prequel trilogies. And this is a thing that sort of reminds me of things now, because laws are dumb sometimes. And proprietary software is uh, can function at the whim of different localities, municipalities, and their laws. Like, actually, printers and scanners, even hardware, since we're talking about the robot have stuff that keep you from printing money or scanning money. Most of them, some of them okay, or mostly do. They tag them and then you can be tracked. Or it's watermarked, yeah. The other thing is software, in software land like Adobe, you can't edit money in Photoshop. In proprietary cloudy Photoshop that you paid for, you can't use your software to do a thing you want to do because U.S. government. And you also don't own it. And you don't own any of the thing. You've merely rented a license. So not to be a free software shill, but, you know... Free software puts arms in air because it's obvious. You could do what you want. Not just free as in beer, but free as in do whatever you want with the thing. You can edit money in GIMP. He should have looked on like GitLab for open source C3PO. The creative, the uh, the GPL version. The Libre Translator. Like it's not as good, but you can do whatever <laughs> you want with it, you know? <laughs> but you can do whatever you want. He's only got 250 languages. It's a little buggy. The real shame about C-3PO was that they killed their friend C-3PO. Like, here's the thing. They have to they have to essentially kill him. They have to wipe him. Which, for the droid, it's like if I gave you irreversible, you don't know who you are, brain damage. I'm killing Colbert, essentially. They have to kill C-3PO to get to the translation. They didn't treat it with any seriousness, and then it didn't mean anything, just like everything else. But I think it's a problem that they did that. It's a problem, but he had backups. Sort of maybe. Full backups on R2-D2. Sort of maybe. Which he didn't trust. Exactly. For some reason saying they're famously buggy. Exactly. When they aren't because they're trusted to carry all this vital information. Dude. Dude. And it worked perfectly. If they turned to Poe and were like, Poe. It have was to- like you hit me on the head and I lost two days. <laughs> Poe, if uh, we have to scramble your brains in order to get this thing, they would all be like aghast and they would say, no, we have to find another way. We're not going to kill our friend Poe. But for C-3PO, no one even asked him. 
They, was, there was no no deliberation over this. Because. Just fry the droid, said Ray. No problem. He was annoying. That was why. He was pretty annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Were they all like secretly hoping they would do that? And you're right. And it and they totally, it didn't make any difference. It didn't make any difference and he was back right away, pretty much, in the movie. Also, but that's, as, as we've discussed in previous ones, droids don't have rights. They treat him and talk to him like he's one of them. Sure. For nine movies. And then when it comes to it that they're going to have to scramble your best friend, the robot, no big deal. No one cares. No one cares. The movie frames it like it's not serious. And so you know as the viewer, like, I don't have to be serious because they're not serious. because the movie knows it's not serious. But they should be goddamn serious. They killed their friend. And maybe he'll be back later. But it's iffy. And your friend might be gone forever. Fate of the galaxy's at stake here. That says a lot about how they talk about droids, about how this how this world treats droids. And not just this world, but these people, we thought they were better than the baseline. And they're like, eh. But again, fate of the galaxy. It wasn't like he said, nah, you could find this out otherwise. And like, shut up, droid. This isn't- anyway. <laughs> Maybe don't, please. This isn't the only time they did that in the movie either. We're like, you know, we're going to kill C-3PO. Maybe little JK, it's not really dead. We're going to kill Chewie. And it could be meaningful. But like, actually, you know, we're playing the shell game. and. Lol JK. Chewie's not dead. Kylo's gonna die. You've got a, uh, like JK. a plot bleed out timer going on here. What do you mean? If you're an important rebel character or to the story, you don't die immediately. Yeah, and I mean, you don't have to kill characters to make something have weight, but you also shouldn't frivolously kill the characters just as a joke on the viewer. They didn't move anything forward. They didn't have to do that. It would. It could have been, what if she actually killed Chewie? That could have been meaningful. The way they did it would have been shitty to just have him be off screen and then be gone forever. But to have her accidentally use her powers to like kill her friends, that could be that could have been meaningful. She wants his head to like plop down in the sand or something <laughs> from the explosion. Maybe. A bunch of fur float. <laughs> it's <just> like hair <laughs> right down. Uh, Is that hair or fur? Fur. I don't think there's a strict definitional difference between the two things. There's probably an interesting etymological background to try to figure out which one you'd prefer. Yeah, is that people were like, we have hair, not fur like those filthy animals, because we're better. <laughs> I think we're looking at the difference between I have hair in my head, and this is a thing I wear because I kill it and put it on my body. Although animals it comes, yeah, don't yeah. kill and then wear. You know. No, no, but look, all the background, the etymology on hair is all the way back. It's just the thing on my head. Hair, 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 just with different letters in the middle. Uh, for fur, we're going back to the Anglo Norman so and so, and the French this, and the Frankish that, and the Middle English over thing. And all of them are like a sheath, a lining, a protecting layer. It's, I kill it and wear it as a fur. And think about it, we call this a fur. Like, this is the product, a fur that I got from these animals I killed. <clears throat> I think the distinction being between, you know, humans and non human creatures. I think that's essentially correct. But if I'm looking at this, I think the real thing to glom onto is that. All the way back, these words are talking about a protective outer layer, and that's what they would be used for. I'm assuming. I'm making the assumption. Shut up, Hanshu. Straight to tape. <laughs> <laughs> but this is interesting for us. Not that's a listener. But back to C-3PO and the knife, because the whole thing with killing him again is that they need to reboot a so-and-so and tarball the gigaflop so that he can have uh, – so they can get the information from his head. He has read the Sith writing on the knife. He has translated it, but he cannot speak the translation. That's actually the limit. The thing I wondered, though, is Sith is a language. The Sith are the bad guy cult. Um, is Sith a language made just for the cult? Like, is this a constructed religion language? And it turns out, no. And it turns out it actually kind of tracks with other, other culty purpose-specific languages in, like, on real life in Earth. Oh, here. In fact, read from Wikipedia. Sith, or the Sith language, was the native tongue of the people of Zyos and Korriban. It was adopted as the mystical language of the Sith Order after the Dark Jedi exiles enslaved the Sith species. And so they've kept the Sith language alive as they are like ecclesiastical, this is our cult's specific language. That's what it is. They didn't just make it up. And I'm thinking that's kind of like Latin with the church. Ecclesiastical Latin. is the That's a dead language. That no one actually speaks in real life, but the church kept on, and it's just like the specialized cult language. It sounds like a lot of work. In I mean, I, I assume here. you already have a functional like language and writing system. Yeah, common or whatever they – what do they call in Star Wars? You just stick with that. Nope. Got to be special. 
And like while we go on the fetch quest to get the thing, to get the thing, to get to the place and get the guy, maybe, we run into all kinds of people and places which may or may not serve much of a purpose. But it's still kind of nice to see. Like Harry Russell was there. I like Harry Russell. I was happy Carrie Russell was in Star Wars. You get to see her eyes. I got to see her eyes for a quick minute. Like, I'm not sure she had any reason to be there other than to make sure we know Poe isn't gay with Finn, which is what should have happened. Hux was a spy and then died immediately, which didn't actually help or do anything for anyone. I'm not sure what the boy was. It was a good gag. Is that why it was there? You only saw the movie the one time, right? No. Oh, you saw it again? Mm -hmm. Maybe you got the same thing as me then. You and I went together with Donnie Migliori, hi Donnie, to see the movie on opening night on Thursday, you know, whatever, as early as possible. I had a very different audience experience between the two viewings. I went with the family on Christmas and it was like the kids or whatever. There weren't a lot of people in that second showing either, but clearly the people with us on opening night were primed and excited for a Star Wars thing. Oh yeah, very different. Like no people clapping the second time or doing any of the crowd stuff. They clapped and cried and guffawed at the places where the movie meant for them clearly to do that. Yeah, they're the fans. Yeah. They're the people that like the movie. I don't know if they like the movie. I think I think they were tricked. Like after getting out of the movie and thinking about it and feeling like nothing happened or affected you, you were just you you were you went in there in good faith and were like, I'm gonna laugh at the things you're supposed to laugh at, and I'm gonna cheer for the things you're supposed to cheer for. But I think that was only because of your investment in Star Wars being there at opening night fan type. Because when I went on Christmas Day, silence. None of those reactions happened. Did you? No, the same experience. I feel like the first crowd on opening night was just being snookered into emotional reactions. Like you're saying that there's there's callbacks. Where the first movie, where the first new movie, where episode seven was like all nostalgia or whatever. It still followed like a satisfying story arc formula and earned those things. As opposed to, it's not just like a collection of references to other things. When I went to multiple viewings of the last one, people kept reacting to the thing. When I went to see multiple viewings of The Force Awakens, people kept reacting to the movie, not just the first night, because it was actually doing it. Rose was there a tiny bit after being, that was a whole controversy somehow, stupid. People are dumb on the internet, all right? And I don't think I liked what they, what her character was doing in the last one, but it was really strange to make her a major character. And then in one of the in the collection of moves that were the big FU to the last movie, they were just like, Rose doesn't talk anymore. She actually doesn't go anywhere either. And it was <laughs> can you how, how unsatisfying that must have been for her. Apparently, though, we watched the movie in opening night, saw it again, and now we're finally recording it after there's been reporting about one of the writers was talking about what happened to Rose. And it was not a very satisfying justification. But for people who care about this, which a lot of the internet seemed to care about this, because they were talking about it a lot. What happened to Rose? Why did they do her dirty? There's like hashtags or whatever. Should have been in the movie more. And apparently she was because they had like their catalog of Leia lines that they were going to work with. And they wrote more Rose stuff to be with Leia. Like that's her, that was, that was her role. Not just staying back and not being in the movie, but staying back and being with Leia to be like the, because they only have so many lines to work with, mm-hmm. to be the person that bounces it. So when Leia's lines got reduced... She just got written out. Yeah, but when it turned out like they couldn't get it together because it was weird. And it was like even the final product was like awkward as hell. Uh, that left a lot of Rose on the cutting room floor. And that was that thing. And so maybe Rose or Carrie Russell or the guy from The Hobbit, like it's why are they even here? Like what was Lando Calrissian doing there? He had really no function. Fan service. Yeah, sure. And being a creep on that teenager or something. I'm not sure what they were going for. Something I'm noticing is that there's a lot of negativity here, a little bit, and in our coverage of Force Awakens or even in The Last Jedi, we had a lot of, I just listened to that episode to see what we were saying about it, and I found myself being, a lot of the time, going, hey, you know, it's, this is really cool. This cool thing happened. This thing was awesome. This thing looked really neat. This was a good idea. This was exciting. And I don't feel like I have a lot of those, except for maybe the Force Dyad thing. Not plot-wise, because I feel like that might have been bad the way it was handled with the Emperor, but just the interaction extended from the last movie between Rey and Kylo with their, like, not just their conversations, but the new wrinkle that there's, like, matter transference between their Force connection. That made for some cool shit. And their fights, when they were fighting in two different places, but also the same place and getting into each other's business. That was the one thing I liked. What's a Force to add, Colbert? Not something they've been burying for three movies and leading up to. No, and then not foreshadowed. Like, hey, guess what? Uh, it's where two, I guess, Force users share the same Force. Something, something. Yeah, they're like same, different people, but one in the Force. That's why they had that 
weird communication. It's like twins with their own language, but it's the Force. But it's such that it's such that the Emperor is able to use it to bring himself back, I guess. And also, one of them can make the other come back from the dead, but will also die. Maybe if they hadn't gotten sucked by the Emperor first, he could have sucked himself onto her, and he wouldn't be dead because he'd have more left. I think your phrasing needs some work. Is it like... Is this do you, how much? How much like life force do you have, and how much did they spend getting sucked by the emperor? But is it life force or is it life force weirdness? Force life force, for, force force <laughs> life force. Yeah, yeah, life force. It makes the thing. The movie doesn't make it make sense, so I don't have to either. Because it's not. It didn't seem like saying, "Oh, I just you know, I'm going to live a year less now, or one year fewer." Oh, oh, oh! It doesn't seem. It's, it's just. I don't know. I'm tired. I like that though. Like the emperor, when the emperor sucked them, they were both gonna die at forty-five. <laughs> I like that they had like a meter. It's like a life meter in a video game. Since we're on a fetch quest anyway, and you only had enough to give her. It's like a credit card. A life. You got two of them. You put balance on the other. <laughs> go back and forth. <laughs> it's like Beavis and Butthead. With the candy bars. I give you a dollar. <laughs> hey Beavis, can I borrow a dollar? <laughs> hey Kylo, can I borrow a force? A force life force. And at the end, you have two dollars and no chocolate. See what I mean, Colbert? It's an analogy. The Emperor said something interesting, I thought. It didn't help explain anything. It didn't make the Force die make a whole lot more sense for the way he was using it. But some things are stronger than blood, he says to Ray, And it made me think of blood is thicker than water. But it made me think of a thing that isn't under Star Wars. Blood is thicker than water is not the full quote. And it doesn't mean what it used to mean. It used to mean the thing he said. The blood of the covenant is thicker than the water of the room. The blah, 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 blah. <laughs> room. <laughs> You're tearing me apart, Kylo. Why everybody betray me? <laughs> what the Emperor was saying is actually in line with the original meaning. People say blood is thick of the water now. They mean like family ties are stronger than whatever else. It was actually the opposite. If you leave all the words in, the blood of the covenant is thick of the water of the womb. This was the bond between soldiers and the battlefield is stronger than the bond of familial connection. Well, and that's the whole thing is the whole diet thing in this. What was supposed to be of it? Does destiny matter or who your parents are? That Apparently. kind of flickered back and forth. <laughs> flickered. The one movie said maybe not, and the other movie said, F you, it certainly does. It was like, no, maybe, <laughs> definitely. <laughs> and then they kiss, and then he dies. And shout out to Adam Driver for totally carrying this movie and not even having any lines in the second half. How about that, huh? Well, he says, Al. <laughs> <laughs> like, the, he just... He's so good. Is so, and that's like Kylo has been Kylo and his interaction with Ray. They've been good. Their thing has been good. It was less good here, but he has been like ca- he carried so much of this by being without lines. And maybe it's good that he didn't have lines because if he had lines, they might have been bad. Just having him emote with his face and act, it was really good. He was really good. Anything that I felt out of this was because of his quality, basically. But she's able to kill the Emperor uh, in the end of the movie because she's got the Jedi's. In her, and she got the Jedi's in her real hard when she has two lightsabers because that's like is that a force multiplier? And that's it. They beat the bad guys, I guess, and that's the end of Star Wars. They'll celebrate. Chewie gets a medal. Uh, I thought this is probably Han Solo's or something. She just took it from whatever. <laughs> Fuck, he doesn't need it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> he's dead. He doesn't need it. There you go. So that's it. That's Star Wars Episode Nine. It's the end of the main arc of Star Wars. Uh, I'm feeling pretty bummed about it. Or maybe you can be hopeful and they'll do interesting new things. Well, and, and for Star Wars, the universe, we know they are because like we're enjoying The Mandalorian so much. And maybe there's Obi-Wan is coming, right? Is Ewan McGregor doing mm-hmm. Obi-Wan? Is that like official? Because maybe that's good too. That'd be sweet. Star Wars. What do we learn? Man, I don't... I. This is one of those times when I realize I don't have the expertise to criticize story structure or writing or anything. Like it's it's I know something's very wrong with what just happened to me. I feel violated by this thing. I don't have the technical words to say why that is. And I find that a little frustrating. I hope it's not very frustrating for everyone listening to me flounder around trying to do it. Something was wrong with that. I just don't have the words. I feel inadequate again. But that's why we avoid like film criticism on the show. And you know, it's their fault for not giving me science stuff to talk about. Yeah. Recommended related stuff. I got something. Remember Pistol Shrimps on YouTube did Star Wars with Tommy Wiseau for the new movie, for the last movie, and it was a short. We recently saw it. 
they did the entire Star Wars saga with Tommy Wiseau. So we made a joke about the room at one point in this episode, I think. And there's a whole like 20 minute. Wow, dude, it's crazy. 20 minute video of Tommy Wiseau. Very well composited. Into oh, yeah. Star a lot Wars. of effort went into making it. Yeah. And it was really funny. It's good. They did a good job. They even went so far as it's clear that they got like body double and acted out some scenes. Like they, they, they put a lot into this. It's really good. So if you're as much of a fan of the room as Star Wars as we might be, then that's going to be in the show notes. And another thing, Colbert. Support your creators online. Support your creators online so they can make Star Wars episodes like everybody just did because the new movie came out and we're no different. Sorry it wasn't last week. I was very ill and so was the family and it was horrible. Thanks for not being mad at us for not being there last week. To our supporters, they are Joe Ferraro, Robert the Roaster, Lucas the Blazing Firework, Alan Michael Pools, Base Wizard Superman, Dean and LG Media, Andy P at Bash 25 Comics, Terrence Lee, Sci-Fi Interfaces Enthusiast Hugh Fisher, Stormtrooper Armor with Nipples Chris Kennard. The Stormtroopers in this one seemed more fragile than, than ever, didn't they? They're always fragile. Why does their armor not block the one thing they get shot with all the time? What's it for? Especially one-shot kill type deal. Every time. Or maybe they're just all tuckered out and taking a nap. They're not actually dead. The, the one thing that happened in this movie that we didn't talk about, there are more defecting stormtroopers. Like, it's not just Finn, but there's whole companies or whatever sort of unit thing in the military of stormtroopers that are being like, nah, we don't want to do this, and they quit and leave. But these heroes still go through, like, chopping these people to death left and right when, like, who knows how many of them are having second thought? Like, they sh- there should be a war well, of ideas here. They shouldn't here. be faceless stormtroopers. Th- they should take off their helmets and be like, hey, I wasn't sure about this anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, dude, they really should have. I mean, they are trying to murder them. So. Oh, no, yeah, in the moment. Like, in the case of the clone troopers, which was the, the – for- they, they were stormtroopers, but the original ones were the clones. Like, they were designed and indoctrinated and, like, grown in a vat for a purpose. You can imagine that they couldn't be reasoned with. Oh, these are indoctrinated kids, so. But they still are, like, just kids that were captured, and a bunch of the time, apparently, they're like, oh, wait, this is bad. I don't want to do it, and they leave. It's not the same moral black and white that it was closer to with the clone troopers anymore, is it? Like, going around murdering murdering child soldiers should feel bad a little, maybe, at some point. And they don't seem to... They're all grown up. It doesn't seem to feel bad. Okay, so it's okay now. Just something to think about. Ah, that's dark. Also, Brian the Sexiest Brother Peterson, Andrew Capitulo the Mighty, Jeff Farmer Schwartman, Michael the Giantess Peterson, Samuel Mumby, Igor Smolinski, Josh Evangy of LSG Media, Mr. Raygun Curly Phil, Temis Sikama, his arms wide, John Juarez, Matt Greek, no colored milk in this one, huh? How disappointing. Not even the same colors, no milk at all. I didn't see any milk. What's a Star Wars movie without milk? Uh, probably the majority of them. <laughs> it's, it's called the normal Star Wars movie. Is that true? It might be true. Gino Lomolino, Adrian Mihaela, Dinosaur Hunter, Arcobia FF Joe Ruppel, Scotty M. Scotty doesn't know. What doesn't Scotty know? That hyperdri- you can't hyperdrive skip in the Millennium Falcon, and TIE Fighters can't follow you in hyperspace either. But now they can. Naked in the desert, alien burning man, Eli Avron, swinging around his tiny elephant trunk, as they did at the Festival of the Ancestors. Also, the star Lord Adam Piper. Jeremy the Top Poster, Carmen Lita Valdez McCoy, Donnie Migliori, Bug Eater Luke Bailey, Alaric Dirk and Gunarm Superhero, Daniel James Barker of Uncertainty Principle of the Podcast, Adrian Falcone of this podcast sometimes, John, champion of half a second of Ewoks Beavers, DJ self-cloning creepy grandpa Moffat, and my mom and grandma Judy, and magical flying Orback Unicorn Jolene Creighton. Orback is what those space horses are called. They're native to the desert planet Pasana, like Jolene. And that's it. Colbert. No, it's not. Story. Just, it's a real <laughs> roller coaster. Thank you, everyone. And anybody else, also consider supporting creators. And if we're the thing you'd like to support, you can go to decipheremedia.tv slash support the show to support the shows. It's also the place you can send anyone who you think might like our show. Please do it. Send them a force hologram. Oh, wait, no, those aren't force holograms, are they? Are they just normal holograms? When they use holograms? Those aren't force holograms. Those are just holograms. <laughs> Send them a hologram I you message. Meant like the um, force persuasion. No, no, no. But like this is the show you're looking for. Oh, do that. Do the hologram, and if that doesn't work, uh, use your persuasion. We trust you. You have skills. And that's it. Rise of Skywalker. 
May the force be with you. I don't know. That's- and also with you. Would you like some lotion? For? Whatever you want. It says hand lotion, but you can put it wherever.